title, Holy Spirit's Departure. Principle, Scripture teaches the final act of the Father's plan will be the adoption of His Son. Turn to Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 22 to 23. But <clears throat> well, we know through the whole creation Ronald and Travelis came together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which are the first fruit of the Spirit. Even we ourselves, grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption, to wit, the redemption of our body. The final act of the Father's plan for His Son is going to be the adoption. The instrument of the adoption process is the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 15. You have received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It is the spirit that enables us to address Him as Father. The indwelling spirit is what enables us to address Him as as Father. The Spirit in each one is uniquely directed to prepare that life for the adoption. In other words, each life is being prepared uniquely by the Spirit, the indwelling Spirit, for the adoption. Turn to John 16th chapter, verse 13. When He, the Spirit of Truth, has come, He will guide you into all truth. <clears throat> For He shall not speak of Himself, but whatsoever He shall hear, that shall He speak, and He will show you things to come. So what he, what's being said here, He doesn't speak for Himself. He speaks what He hears from the Father. So you have the indwelling Spirit in each individual candidate for adoption, speaking to them directly from the Father, not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit acts as a conduit because it is the Father who is progressing each one that He calls to become the finished product. The Spirit in each one is uniquely directed to prepare that life for adoption. Revelation, the 21st chapter, verse 7. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I'll be his God, and he shall be my son. The Holy Spirit, under the aegis of the Father, directing us to overcome each obstacle until we reach the final phase of our preparation, the consummation, the adoption. It teaches, during the new birth, the saint receives a measure of the Holy Spirit from the Father. 2 Corinthians, 1st chapter, verse 21 to 22.
Now he which established us with you in Christ and hath anointed us is God, who hath also sealed us and given us the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. And the word earnest there means the installment, first installment, the first pledge. It's what we would call a down payment. So, during the new birth experience, which is unique to each and every individual, the measure, the earnest, the installment, first installment of the Holy Spirit, is given by the Father to each one. And it is this arrangement which sets the pattern, the person's life, in motion toward the finished product. In other words, there's a path. The Father's ordained and on that path. The individual is to progress, to traverse <coughs> a series of passages uniquely designed for that life until it reaches the finished stage. The last um what would be considered series of obstacles leading to the ultimate adoption. <coughs> Scripture teaches, at the redemption of the body, the Spirit receives, the saint receives the fullness of the Holy Spirit, completing the adoption process. Ephesians, the first chapter, verse 13 to 14. In whom you also trusted... After that you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. The Holy Spirit is called the Spirit of promise, the Spirit of addition, which is the earnest of our inheritance until, until the redemption of the purchased possession, unto the praise of His glory. So the down payment resides in each and every one of us that's experienced the new birth. It's put there until that life enters into the final stage of completion. At that point, Scripture teaches those who are obedient to the direction of the Holy Spirit in their lives are matured. Immature by each experience they overcome. Second Corinthians, the third chapter, verse seventeen to eighteen. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, freedom. But we all with open face, beholding as in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. When he's speaking about glory stages, he's talking about stages of maturity leading to the final stage. So at any point, the individual drops out what he does is he shuts down his progression to the next stage. And the day where the XY axis crosses, he won't be ready. The change that would take place if he allowed the progression won't take place. Principle. Along with life-changing experiences, the Spirit prepares the saint for the revelation knowledge. God the Father will reveal through the Spirit the things that you're enduring or He'll send you into a place where you can get the understanding 
The scripture says, I would not keep you, I would not leave you ignorant. God wants us to know what we're going through and why we're going through it and how we can expect to complete it. John, the 16th chapter, verses 14 and 15. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. All things that the Father hath of mine, therefore said I, that he shall take of mine, and shall show it unto you. The Holy Spirit is constantly giving us revelation, understanding of the things. The problem that we have is our focus. If our focus is not open to receive it, but our focus is caught up with the vicissitudes of the problems we're dealing with, life experiences, pursuing the desires of the flesh, then we shut down. But the Holy Spirit would have us to understand about our own progress toward the, the completion stage. Scripture teaches the one who is in tune with the spirit of adoption will know when the time is near. Jesus speaks about this in Luke, the 21st chapter, verse 28. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. You will know. The Spirit will give you understanding of when you're reaching the final stage. You might not realize the progressive stages, but you'll know the final stage because Jesus says so. When the XY axis crosses, that will be the time when you realize that you must focus totally on this last sprint in order to be ready for the final change. Scripture teaches at the moment of the adoption the fullness of the Spirit will encompass the entirety of the saint's being. It will happen instantaneously. And I repeat that. At the moment of the adoption, the fullness of the Holy Spirit will encompass the entirety of the saint's being instantaneously. Romans 8, verse 11. But if the Spirit of Him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, He that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by His Spirit that dwelleth in you. It's the same process that Jesus experienced when He was resurrected from the dead. Very same process, being full, the quicken life throughout the entirety of His being. Turn to... 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, verse 52. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, with the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised, incorruptible. The dead shall be raised, incorruptible. So we shall be changed. He's talking about the same thing happens to the dead that happens to the living. It's a total encompassing 
of life, life being glory, splendor, power, the fullness of the Spirit, instantaneously. And only those that are ready at that instantaneous moment are going to experience it. <clears throat> Scripture teaches the Holy Spirit will depart the earth, taking the adopted sons to the Father's throne. Revelation 4, verses 1 to 5. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show you things <clears throat> which must be hereafter. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and beheld a throne that was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. He did, was to look upon like a jasper and a sardine stone, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, inside like unto an emerald. So what he sees is the Father. He sees the throne. He sees the impenetrable light. The light which first is described in First Timothy as the unapproachable light. And then he sees everything that's located within this light. It's a canopy over this region. He sees the Father and he also sees the throne. And then he sees the things that are taking place round about the throne. Verse 4. Round about the throne were four and twenty seats. Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting. Now the elder connotation means an individual who is a repositor of a dom domination, a repositor of wisdom, a repositor of knowledge. The focus of elders throughout the Bible refers to the individual who has reached a position in which they are approached as overseers, administrators, counselors, um, individuals who constitute a high position of authority. Peter describes himself as an elder. <clears throat> Paul describes himself as an elder. The, the pinnacle of position is reflected in the elders, the elders of Israel of the counselors of Israel, the administrators of Israel. So this is referring to the counselors, the administrators, the wisdom focus of the heavens seated around the throne. Four and twenty seats. Upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and head on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings, and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So what we see here is what takes place at the end of the rapture, the end of the appearing. We don't see the Lord. It's not described here. Why? Because He is in the group. We see the Father. We see the elders that is, the sons of God who have taken the presence of the Father, among whom is the Lord. He's the elder brother. And we see the seven spirits. And the seven spirits are the completion of the Holy Spirit. The number seven is symbolic of divine completion. So what we see is the result. We see the end of the Father's plan for the sons of God. The Holy Spirit is the instrument, the agency which the Father uses to bring about the completion of the sons. 
we see the elders in the position that the Father predetermined them to be in in eternity, Romans 8, 28, 30, 28 to 30, and we see the Father himself, who is the originator, of the architect of this plan. We see the fulfillment of all of this in Revelation 4, chapter, verses 1 to 5. This is the position that we are striving for. This is the path that we are on in the motion that we have been set in, which is to remain constant, not to slacken, to go to one place or another, to be, to be deviated. <clears throat> At this point, we're gonna uh, we're gonna experience the roughest part of the journey, because the enemy is gonna pull out all stops. Circumstances are gonna be there to try to get us to veer, get us to focus every way but where the Spirit is directing us, where the Spirit is focused, have, having us focus the preparation that we need to have in order to achieve, in other words, be ready when the final change takes place. When we enter into this imminent period from the beginning of sorrows, <clears throat> if we are distracted, by events that are taking place in this disintegrating world system, we run the risk of not being ready to experience the change. We must remain focused on the Father, the Spirit's direction, and believe the Father to take care of the uh, outer circumstances. The enemy is going to pull out all stops to, to do just the opposite make us take control of our circumstances, to have us focus on the senses so that when the time comes for the change, we won't be prepared. <clears throat> Title, The Danger Beyond. Principle, for those in Christ, God becomes their world. Those in Christ, God becomes their world. Turn to Acts, the 17th chapter, verse 28. verse 28. For in Him we live and move and have our being. As certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also His offspring. <clears throat> for those in Christ, God becomes their whole world. That's His design and His plan. Turn to Psalms 91 verse, verse 1. Uh -huh. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. So literally, or spiritually, we enter into a world with parameters, borders, boundaries, with extensive um, things that pertain to it. God orchestrates a zone of habitation for us. Turn to John. 15th chapter, verse 7.
John 15, verse 7. If ye abide in me, my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, it shall be done unto you. So if we're abiding in this habitation, this world, which is God, then the promises that we read in the scripture become ours. Turn to John, the 10th chapter, verses 7 to 9. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I said to you, I am the door of the sheep. Verily, he presented himself as a portal, an entrance. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved, and shall go in and out and find faster. So then we're describing a habitation, a world, in which the life of the individual is lived within the parameters that God has designed for us. Several scriptures allude to this. Turn to Psalm 16, verse 11. Psalm 16, verse 11. Then wilt thou show me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. At thy right hand are pleasures forevermore. In this world that is God, we experience all the goodness, all the fulfillment, all the glories that are promised to us in the scripture. Psalms 91, verses 4 to 9. He shall cover thee of his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. This is referring to a canopy, a literal sphere of enclosure, of habitation that God erects over the person. Will cover thee with his feathers, and under his wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield and buckler. Thou shalt not be afraid for the, for the terror by night, nor for the hour that flieth by day nor for the pestilence that walketh in darkness, nor for the destruction that wasteth at noonday. All this stuff is outside of the dwelling, the habitation, the world that the saint is in. A thousand shall fall by thy side, and ten thousand at thy right hand, but it shall not come nigh thee. Only with thine eyes shall thou behold and see the reward of the wicked. Because thou hast made the Lord, which is my refuge, even the Most High, thy habitation. God becomes the saint's world. And everything that takes place in this world is of God. Then Hebrews, the fourth chapter, verses 9 to 10. <coughs>
was 4, 9, and 10. And there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. But he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works, as God did from his. So in this world, it's got its own priorities, its own principles, its own lifestyle, its own requirements. In other words, when it says he ceased from his own labors, he ceased from the priorities of the world system, labors of the world system, life of the world system, the outer world. He's entered into God's world, a radically different reality. Scripture teaches those that go beyond the parameters of God's world will encounter hardship and grief. John 15, verse 6. If a man abide not in me, leaves, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered, and men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. Leave out the parameters of God's world, and the person enters into a reality of <coughs> pain, agony, trial, and tribulation. Matthew 23, verses 37 to 38. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how they kill us the prophets, and stonest them that which are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate. So it's talking about the provision, the shield, the reality, the world that he would have provided for Israel, but they would not. They wouldn't allow it. Therefore, they were left as Jerusalem is currently left, as he's saying here, to the vicissitudes and the dangers and the destruction of the outside world. We have the ability to remain in the shield of protection, or we can leave. Some do. When they do, they experience destruction. Principle. We move within God's world as we pursue our calling and the things of the kingdom. In other words, we remain within the parameters of God's protection, God's world, God's habitation, as we pursue our calling and the things of the kingdom. Turn to First Timothy, 6th chapter, verse 12. First chapter, is this one? Uh, First Timothy, sixth chapter. Six. I heard six, but I. Fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold on eternal life whereunto thou art called. In other words, he's telling him, pursue 
your calling and has professed a good profession before many witnesses. As we pursue our gift and our calling, we travel within God's world, within the world of protection, within the world of blessings, within the world of the promises of all things. Turn to Matthew, 6th chapter, verse 31 to 33. <clears throat> Thirty-one to thirty-three. Therefore, take no thought, saying, "What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed?" In other words, if we don't need this, and we are concerned and caught up with being concerned about our provision, what is going to uh, our needs? If we get caught up with that, we put ourselves outside of God's world. For, after all these things, do the Gentiles, who are outside of God's world, seek. For your Heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Pursue your gift and your calling. Pursue the kingdom of God. And all things will come to you. Everything I got here, this shirt, these shoes, these pants, this book, is given to me. I didn't pay a dime from any of it. This Bible, given. All these things come to you as you pursue your gift, your calling, promises that he will see to it oh yeah this hand too that he'll see to it that your needs are going to be met turn to uh, Matthew 25th chapter when we leave God's world we leave God's world by submit, submitting ourselves to the law of the world. Then we take upon ourselves the world's priorities and experience. And we begin to suffer the consequences. Matthew 25, verses 16. God bless you. Sixteen what? Sixteen to eighteen. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. Likewise he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. That's what we find here. Three people. The two are progressing in God's world, multiplying their talents. At the same time, the third one is taking his and he's dug a hole and he's hidden it. He's cut himself off from his gift and his calling and his relationship to God while his brothers are experiencing the progression in God, in Christ. At the end, and they all have to stand before the Lord and give an account. So what's being said is, as we stay in God's world, the world that He's designed for us to stay in, pursuing our gift, our calling in the kingdom, we are progressing consistently. 
if we step outside by separating ourselves from the world that God has designed us to live in, if we put ourselves in an adversarial position in ultimate judgment. And this one does. To Revelation, the 18th chapter, verse 4. Revelation, the 18th chapter, verse 4. And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, to be not partakers of her sins, and that you receive not of her plagues. She's talking about those that are outside of God's world, in the world. He's telling them, come out. Um, release, relinquish your habitation in the world. Come back into God's world. My question arises, how do you know where you are? How do you know whether you're in the world that God designed you to be in, or if you've left, gone outside of it? Turn to Romans, 12th chapter, verses 1 and 2. Romans 12, chapter, verses 1 to 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. So that's the first thing. Are we totally committed to Jesus Christ? Is He first love in our life? That's the first thing that, that we analyze, our relationship, our commitment. Then, end. Be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. The renewing process. Coming into our mind enables us to gauge where we are. Whether we're conforming to the world, or whether we're being transformed by the renewing process process. The renewing process takes place every single day within us. When we yield to the desires of the Spirit within us, we understand positionally where we are. God designed it to be that way. Turn to Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 17 to 24. explains this whole aspect of being able to gauge a position, whether we're in Christ, in the world Christ has designed us to function in, or whether we're outside of it. Verse 17, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their minds. So this is the first thing he's talking about. Unsaved people walk in Vanity. Their mind is totally void of direction. They, they have no concept of the true direction that their life is taking. So he's saying to Christians, don't allow yourself to, to degrade to that level where you don't know. You have to always be alert to determine what direction you're going into. Having the understanding darkened being alienated from the life of God, God's world, through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. In other words, they're walking in darkness